What up, Ring Crew Army and AEW fans? Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows. And on this episode, I will be going over AEW All Out. AEW All Out felt like a WrestleMania pay-per-view with all the surprises that they gave us. It was Christmas without being December. And it was definitely one hell of a night. And I wasn't expecting any of those surprises. You can truly say that AEW went all out for their pay-per-view. Now, this review is going to be a little bit different. I will be going through the matches, but I will not be breaking down each and every single one of those matches like how I normally do. But I'll give you my perspective on it. Anything that they could have changed, anything I was feeling about it. I was already on previous other podcast shows talking about AEW All Out. If you are not following Bama Slamma Podcast, along with Smacked Raw Pod, they do shows like The Review, Unpopular Wrestling Opinions, which I was on there last night. And then they also do previews to big time pay-per-views such as AEW All Out. You could also follow their individual accounts such as at Bama Dave 24 and at the KYTY show. I will drop all their handles at the end of this podcast episode and ways for you to support them as well as supporting myself and the Square Circle Podcast. And if you are a returning listener, I highly thank you for for returning and listening to me talk about professional wrestling. If you are new to the Square Circle Podcast, just know that I wear my heart on my sleeve. I love professional wrestling. I'm getting into professional wrestling commentary. So if you see my commentary videos float around, just make sure to tag a promotion that you want me to work with. And if you're new here, thank you for being new. Thank you for possibly becoming a potential fan of the show. And I highly thank everyone that supports the Square Circle podcast and supports all of my creative adventures because this is what I love to do. I love to talk about professional wrestling and that's all I care about. So let me jump right into this 2021 AEW All Out review. We start off with the buy-in. The buy-in had a 10-man tag. On one side, we had Jurassic Express, which was Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, teaming up with best friends Chuck Taylor, Orange Cassidy, and Wheeler Yuta. Their opponents was the Matt Hardy office, the big team that Matt Hardy has, which should eventually break up. So we have Matt Hardy teaming up with TH2, which is... And Helico and Jack Evans and have private party on their side as well. A big tag team to start off AEW. They put this on the buy-in. Originally, it was the women's casino battle royale to be on the buy-in, but they bumped that up since Pac was having travel issues. I also thought Andrade was having travel issues, but he didn't. He showed up. He had a little segment on the show. But other than that, we get this tag team match. This tag team match obviously felt very thrown together. It just wasn't, there wasn't story to be like, all right, we're going to have this here. It did set a tone for the rest of the pay-per-view. And I know that the pay-per-view was going to be fun. There was a lot of spots in this match, a lot of flips and everybody remembering where they had to be at what time and doing what move. I am honestly tired of the Matt Hardy office and how big it grows. And it doesn't make any sense anymore. Matt Hardy wants to teach the younger generation on how to be successful like him. And I totally get it, but you're not doing anything substantial with the Matt Hardy brand. I would like it if Matt Hardy comes back to broken Matt Hardy and we get more serious storylines where it makes sense where you want to be invested in a story. I want to be invested in a story. I don't necessarily like matches where it's just wrestling and just wrestling alone. That's why part of me stopped watching AEW Dark is because it felt way too long, 
having 16 matches. If I wanted to, I could have just went to an indie show in order for me to watch regular wrestling matches with nothing behind it. And then also having Ref Aubrey being overdramatic, that was another reason why I stopped watching AEW Dark. But back to this tag team match. Jungle Boy picked up the win for his team via submission. He hooked on the snap trap on Angelico and Angelico just tapped. After the match, there wasn't really much celebrating to be had because the Butcher came out and the Butcher has now returned to AEW and at the side of the Matt Hardy brand. Now we get to go into the main card of All Elite Wrestling All Out. I was not expecting AEW to start everything off with Miro versus Eddie Kingston for the TNT Championship title. I was not expecting them to start really hot and heavy with this match. This match was really good. You have Eddie Kingston, who's the brawler, who's a never say die type of guy and definitely from out here from New York City. And then you have Miro, who is the redeemer, who is beating everybody and creating this wonderful story that is really enticing to watch. The only thing that I found weird about the match was the ending of the match. So at one point, Eddie Kingston manages to take off the turnbuckle when Miro is trying to pull him away from the corner. Eddie Kingston manages to get the turnbuckle off. So now we have an exposed turnbuckle. And the referee sees this is there for a while. You as a fan, if you caught it, you would know that eventually they will have a spot and someone is going to either have their head driven into it or their back driven into it. We've seen it countless times, right? It's used as a mechanism to get the upper hand, to cheat a little bit and try to take either a championship title off of somebody or just get a victory. So when they finally go ahead and try to use it for that spot, camera is focused on the referee who is Bryce Rensburg. And then you have Miro and Eddie Kingston fighting it out. And the camera just stays there and you can see how conflicted the referee is. And he knows what's about to happen. We all know what's about to happen. Eddie Kingston tries to push Miro into the exposed turnbuckle and the referee gets into the way. Miro then goes over to the side and Eddie Kingston and the referee has a couple words and the match continues to go on. And eventually Eddie Kingston loses and does not pick up the victory against Miro. Miro retains his championship title based off of that little interaction and then continuing to beat down Eddie Kingston and then eventually pick up the victory and still is champion. I don't understand why they did that spot where the referee jumps in to just stop everything because, you know, the referee could have got hurt. He could have took a ref bump and then Miro and Eddie could have beat each other up a little bit longer, maybe added some chair, some violence in it. And then maybe another referee would have had to come down to count a three or maybe Bryce could have just woken up and count the three himself. But I just did not like the way that it was. It was so awkwardly placed and you know that it was going to happen. It didn't feel natural. It was like trying to count down the time for when Eddie was going to push Miro into the thing. And then he just gets in between them. And sometimes I feel like if you are going to be doing that in AEW, if you are going to have your referees be in certain situations such as that, and then the other referee thing that happened a little bit later on in the pay-per-view, which I'll get to, please have certain referees get into certain storylines because then if they don't have a consistency of doing this when they are not refereeing their best friend's matches, it's going to look weird, it's going to look awkward, and I'm definitely going to find the flaw the AEW fan base are not going to find a flaw for it, but I will find it and I'll point it out. I just felt that that was an awkward segment for Rensburg to do that with Eddie Kingston because now Eddie Kingston can create a case against that referee to be like, hey, you've been screwing me ever since the beginning and I thought we're supposed to be friends. So, 
yeah, I just didn't like the ending part. Congratulations to Miro for retaining the TNT Championship title. After the opening match, we get John Moxley versus Satoshi Kojima. Satoshi Kojima is a legend of New Japan Pro Wrestling. He is the master of the lariat and also the head honcho for the bread club. And he is definitely my pick for whenever he enters an AEW ring, maybe an impact ring. I'm always going to go with the New Japan guys. New Japan right now are really creating amazing storylines and they're putting on amazing matches, even through COVID and how COVID is really crippling Japan over there, but they're making it work. And then now that we have New Japan over here in the States and they're going on their own tour here, representing New Japan strong and all the rest of the regular New Japan guys is going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing, guys. So John Moxie comes down through the crowd wearing a GCW hoodie. Now, if you don't know by now, John Moxie is the new GCW champion. He took it off Matt Cardona in GCW's war game show that happened the night before AEW All Out. So John Moxie is the new GCW champion. I really wanted Matt Cardona to have a little bit longer of a reign of being GCW champion. Then again, let me remind you guys, I am not a GCW fan. I do not cover GCW. I know nothing about them. I don't know the history, but I do know Matt Cardona. And I did like the fact that he was the champion because that gave it a little bit more flexibility. He could be really outrageous and ridiculous with his set of rules of how he wants to change GCW until some badass comes along and takes it from him. Did I want Moxie to take it from him? No. Does Moxie need the championship title? No. But fans online are always like, we want Nick Gage versus John Moxley. And I guess this is how you do it. You make John Moxley champion. You have Nick Gage chase John Moxley. And you would have thought that Nick Gage would have went after Matt Cardona for that championship title right away when Matt took it off of Nick Gage. But back to this John Moxley versus Kojima match, it was surprisingly good. I really enjoyed it. I was really rooting for Kojima to get a victory over John Moxley, but unfortunately that did not happen. Even though they were having a good back and forth battle and John Moxley Felt those amazing lariats that everyone talks about and everyone puts over. Even Tama himself putting over Kojima's lariat. But unfortunately, John Moxley picks up the victory. And then the unthinkable happens. John Moxley is in the ring. And then we hear the theme song to Minoru Suzuki. Another New Japan Pro Wrestling legend. He is also known as Murder Grandpa. And guys, if you do not know who Suzuki is, please go Google him and then also pay attention to the Square Circle podcast as I will be reviewing his matches and talking about him. But Murder Grandpa comes out and the fans were electric. They knew who he was and they sang along to his theme song. When it hit down to that Kazi Nina hair, it felt fantastic and it felt like Suzuki was definitely a big deal, especially in John Moxley's eyes. You could definitely tell that he wanted this. He wouldn't mind fighting Suzuki, but he's going to be in one hell of a fight with Suzuki. And guess what, guys? That match is going to be free on AEW Dynamite. Today, September 8th, 2021, we get a free match of this caliber, John Moxley versus Minoru Suzuki on AEW Dynamite on free TV, not even a pay-per-view. So you guys better tune in. And at the time of this recording, it is Wednesday. It is AEW Dynamite. And this is a late review. I get it. I know. Let's continue the hype. 
Because right after this, I really thought it was a bad placement, but I was proven wrong. So after this hype, we get the women's championship title match, which was Britt Baker versus Chris Statlander. And I enjoyed this match. I know these women can hold their own and they held their own right after that big surprise of Suzuki coming out. That was the only thing I was nervous about was the fact that Suzuki is a big name. He's there with John Moxley. And we have the women to try to follow that up. Not saying that, you know, the women can't follow it up right after something like that. But when AEW is known to not really boost the women's division on how we would like it, this is where I get a little nervous and want to make sure that the women have a good showing so that way people on Twitter don't shit on them. Then again, we have Britt Baker and Chris Statlander who are really good in the ring and they really gave us a good show. They really gave us a good match back and forth. Chris Statlander looked very smooth in the ring despite having coming back from injury. Britt Baker gave us a surprise Panama Sunrise, which is just a Canadian destroyer to Chris Statlander. That was a little Easter egg for later on in this review. However, Britt Baker locking in the lockjaw manage to have her pick up the victory and retain that AEW Women's Championship title. The next match on the AEW All Out card was the cage match that had the Lucha Brothers versus the Young Bucks for their AEW World Tag Team Championship titles. And oh boy, did I change my tune about the Young Bucks. I've said before on the previous podcast episodes that they have that go-home heat. They really do. And sometimes they don't see it. Other people don't see it. They make fun of the fans that keep saying it. They have the go home heat because they're doing everything in a ridiculous manner. That's like times 10. You wanted the young bucks. You got the young bucks of the two thousands where they were at their peak and they were still doing ridiculous stuff, but now they're turning it up times 10 and they're looking like they're having midlife crisis without being 50 years old. What I originally wanted to see from the Young Bucks was the Young Bucks actually doing professional wrestling in the middle of that ring, changing up their whole entire style because with years of being the way that they are and the way that they take their bumps and all the matches they've been through, your body goes through a toll and sometimes your body is like, I can't wake up today. We're not going to go for a run today. I'm not going to do that. My bones are going to crack every time that I walk. Wrestlers put their bodies through so much that eventually their own body is like, no. So what would have shut up all the critics? All the critics that kept saying that the Young Bucks can't do this, the Young Bucks can't do that. The Young Bucks are just spot monkeys. Well, guess what? Turn yourselves into the Young Bucks. But fucking wrestle in the middle of the ring you know show me move for move make sure that the opponent that you have can think on their feet and try to get out of whatever hold you have them in just don't do any rest holds that are very visible and they're longer than necessary and you're just poking fun at us but i will have to say that this match definitely changed my mood because they brought me into the story And that's what the Young Bucks are good at. The Young Bucks are good at telling you a story, getting you emotionally connected. However, you really do have to sit there and slosh through all the shit that they give you before you can find the gems and appreciate the Young Bucks. The way you appreciate the Young Bucks is by sitting there and letting them do their stupid shit. And then you'll find the golden nugget and then you'll be like, Well, this emotionally connected with me. This emotionally is a memorable moment of the Young Bucks' career, depending on what they're doing. And that's exactly how I see the Young Bucks. And that's exactly how they market themselves. And that's exactly what they do day in and day out. I do not know if I will ever go back a couple years from now, like go back in time to revisit this whole stupid elite storyline and actually sit there and look at it and try to convince myself and convince others that this was a really good storyline in hindsight. I don't really think I'm going to do that, but you never know. 
But if you ever wanted to know why the Young Bucks are really adored, it's because they do know how to tell stories. They do know how to bring you in. It's just that you got to sift through all that fucking shit they give you rather than them just being like, hey, this is why we're good. Anyway, no disrespect taken away from the Lucha Brothers. They always perform at their highest level as a tag team. They are so well connected with each other to make sure that every single move that they do is really, really great. Every single save that happens, you feel it because it's one brother helping out another brother so that way they don't lose the match. So there goes your inner conflict there. The conflict of the Lucha Bros has one shot. Get this done and get those tag team titles off of the Young Bucks. They threw it back to PWG days by having the sneaker with the thumbtacks. That's a throwback to Candice LeRae of Matt Jackson kicking her in the face and having her wear a crimson mask. And they did this with Penta. Penta was all bloodied up. His mask was completely torn and Phoenix's mask was torn. But both of them had the ambition and the perseverance to not stop, to not allow the Young Bucks to continue their reign as AEW World Tag Team Champions. The Lucha Brothers did a very wonderful job in this match. They also did a second rope Canadian Destroyer onto Matt Jackson. And then Matt Jackson pops right back up in order for them to do their next spot, which was just slapping each other around in a circle. And this is where sometimes critics are right when they assess a Young Bucks and Lucha Brothers match. Now, granted, their styles mesh very well together, so you really can't get on them or fault them 99% of the time because of their styles. And it's cool if that style does not resonate with you. And I totally get it, too, because sometimes I'm like, yo, I want a little more psychology. You could have stayed down a little bit more while maybe Nick was going to do something to Penta or Phoenix was going to come in and, you know, team with Penta and then take on Nick for a little while while Matt Jackson was recovering in the middle of the ring while he's recovering from a Canadian destroyer from the second rope. If they would have allowed a couple more seconds, maybe like three minutes tops for him to recover in the middle of the ring, then start moving. Then you go to your next move. Don't just do move, 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 and then maybe breathe. And then another move like, no, I need some psychology behind these moves that happen in the ring because a second rope. Canadian Destroyer is no joke. It's not the same way of just taking a chop or taking some small move from the second rope and you're able to get back up. Tell me that these moves hurt. Let me know that these moves are killing you. Scream if you have to. Like, let me believe that you're getting hurt. Let me believe that Penta really does want to end this. And by ending this, he's going to have to put himself through more pain and put you through greater pain in order to achieve the end goal, which is grabbing the tag team titles. And those little fixes in your matches, Matt and Nick Jackson, will make all the critics shut the fuck up. It's okay to slow down a match while still having a fast speed going. But you don't want to do fast, 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 and then like a breather and then more fast, 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 fast. Like, I want to enjoy the fact that there's a story going on of two teams who are brothers and they are phenomenal at what they do and really want to show why they are the best tag team in AEW and why they want the championship titles so bad. So to close this out for this cage match between the Young Bucks versus the Lucha Bros, the Lucha Bros, rightfully so, became our new AEW World Tag Team Champions. And I was ecstatic. I felt the emotion. And like I said, they brought me into the match. I got emotionally invested into the match more closer towards the ending, there was something there that just clicked and I was like, oh, I'm invested now. Next, after that amazing steel cage match, we get the Women's Casino Battle Royale. And so we had all of the 
suits come out, meaning clubs, spades, diamonds, hearts, and then the Joker card. And everybody was in the match. There were way too many women for me to tell you exactly who was in there. You guys already watched it. So we have our Joker revealed as Ruby Soho. Her destination was Chicago all along, and it was definitely that women's battle royale. So she gets into the ring, and it eventually comes down to her versus Thunder Rosa. Now, my pick is Thunder Rosa. That was my pick. If it wasn't her, it could have been Big Swell. It could have been Diamante because those two girls need to be featured on Dynamite and not on Dark. However, it was down to Thunder Rosa and Ruby Soho. And I wish that Thunder Rosa would have won that battle royale. Ruby Soho won the battle royale fresh off signing her AEW contract to become All Elite. And, you know, I have nothing against Ruby Soho. I enjoyed her work in WWE. She's really passionate. She's really talented. But she just stepped through those doors. And Thunder Rosa has been working her fucking ass off. Even made her own women's promotion while still working for AEW. And then finally on her birthday was given her AEW contract to become all elite. And this was her time. And all of a sudden, Ruby Soho that just left WWE and is on this runaway away from them to come to a safe haven gets the opportunity to face Britt Baker for her AEW Women's Championship title. Like, how does that work? If you really look at it on the surface level, that's like some WWE booking. And that's some really quick, cheap pop booking. I get it. Ruby Soho is definitely a fan favorite. Again, I am a fan of her. But you cannot deny the fact that Thunder Rosa helped carry AEW through the pandemic. When fans were being let in slowly, she carried the women's division on her back along with Britt Baker and also Big Swell. Like, what story are you going to create Now that Ruby Soho won the Battle Royale and there has been no established foundation between Britt Baker and Ruby Soho for there to make sense for why she would have won. Thunder Rosa already laid down her groundwork to challenge Britt Baker for that women's championship title because of the matches that they had in AEW, because of the mini feud that they had in AEW. So there's already a backstory there. What is the backstory behind Ruby Soho winning and then challenging Britt Baker for her championship title? I know we're gonna probably going to get our answer on AEW Dynamite, but that did not make sense for that to happen. I don't want to take away the fact that she won. Congratulations that she won the Casino Battle Royale to get that opportunity. But that's just pushing all the other women that work hard and been there for a while kind of towards the back. It would have been fine if Thunder Rosa won the Casino Battle Royale and Ruby Soho came up second because then now you can ease her in to a story that will make sense when we get to a triple threat match because Ruby Soho should be like, hey, Thunder Rosa, that was a fluke. I know I should have won. I've been in multiple battle royales before and I know I could beat you. So therefore, let me challenge you to a one on one match. And bam, we have a one-on-one match. Thunder Rosa is going to pick up the victory over Ruby Soho if that happens because Thunder Rosa just has that experience. Like, I would want a story where Ruby Soho is chasing after this dream of becoming a champion and being valued where in her previous employment, she really wasn't valued. But I will want this story of a chase between her and Thunder Rosa to build up a foundation and then also get involved with Britt Baker and Britt coming out to just attack both of them because she doesn't want to deal with both of them. And then there you go. That is how you end up creating a story where it's simple and then you can make it more complicated as it goes along. But you have a foundation built for Ruby Soho to ease her into the AEW product, to ease her into that championship 
title match eventually that she'll get. Don't just give it to her right off the back because what's going to happen, AEW fans? You tell me. What's going to happen when Ruby Soho does not take that belt off of Britt Baker when we come to the end? Is anyone going to be upset at it? Is anyone going to give any excuses? Like... I would love to know. I would want to know your comments. Make sure to leave them down at youtube.com forward slash square circle podcast. Or if you're listening to this on anchor, anchor has a voice message feature where you could definitely leave me your thoughts there. Or if you want to take it to Twitter at Marie underscore shadows, you should be following me. So make sure you leave a reply there as well. That was my only story issue problem with Ruby Soho winning. I have nothing against Ruby Soho at all. I want to see her blossom. I know that she has a lot of amazing ideas bursting at the seams. But then again, when someone works hard, why are they pushed to the side? And then someone new and squeaky who has that WWE moniker on them gets the opportunity. Next, we come to MJF versus Chris Jericho. And the stipulation for this one is, if Jericho loses, he can never wrestle in an AEW ring again. First of all, I am over this story. It has been going on way too long. I totally get it. You know, I enjoyed it from the beginning and then it just dragged and lagged and there was nothing new. It's like, what else can you do? Nothing. MJF had the five labors of Jericho. They should have had the fifth labor of Jericho on AEW All Out with that stipulation of if Jericho loses, he could never wrestle in the AEW ring again. And I need to learn to stop betting against Chris Jericho, no matter if it's for the sake of storytelling. Ladies and gentlemen, I love storytelling and professional wrestling. That's how you get me. I do not care about wrestling journalism where they email people and try to get into people's lives and be like, hey, this person's contract is up. This person is doing this. This person is doing that. Oh, what personal thing that this person is doing in their personal life? They put that on blast and I'm here like, can you just tell me a story? Tell me a story. I'll be happy and I'll keep it in kayfabe. And that is what I do on this podcast. So for the sake of storytelling, I need to learn not to bet against Chris Jericho no matter what. I do want to give props to MJF for hooking me into thinking that we were going to get Y2J with that entrance. This match started off slow and then it picked up and I was okay with it. The ending is what I really want to talk about because I want to touch back with the beginning of the pay-per-view where we had that little weird, awkward altercation between Bryce Rensburg and Eddie Kingston. And this relates to what happens at the end of MJF versus Chris Jericho. MJF hits a move. He covers Chris Jericho. Aubrey counts one, two, three. However, as she's starting to bring her hand down on the third count Chris Jericho puts his foot on the rope he doesn't see it so she calls the match as normal as MJF winning and having the bell rung to signify that the match is over and MJF has his arm around Aubrey and not allowing her to see that Jericho's foot is on the rope and then the senior official comes down the ramp and tells Aubrey that Jericho's foot has been on the rope and we're going to restart this match. And instead of ref Aubrey going over to Justin Roberts to say that we're going to restart the match, the senior referee does this and the match gets restarted and then Jericho does what he does and he has MJF in the lion tamer and MJF taps out and then Jericho wins and he's still able to wrestle in the AEW ring. Now, the only reason why I bring up that little ref thing that they did is because when I first saw it, I immediately got happy because I was like, oh, look, it's a WWE thing. Like, I was super excited because AEW is known not to utilize the referees as well as how they should in wrestling, meaning that we barely get count outs. We barely get DQs. We barely get any other stipulation you are used to as a fan for watching professional wrestling for over 20 years. So the moment that this happens, I get super excited and I don't care. I'm not even mad at it because I'm like, finally, AEW is doing something that is natural, that it's okay. But obviously, we could always turn that into a storyline where maybe MJF 
paid off ref aubrey but then again if she had to ask her husband if she could send feet pictures to a random person that was willing to pay her for those feet pictures and her husband said no and she listened to him apparently the person was going to pay her maybe like 600 it might be an exaggeration i don't remember the comment that she gave but if she listened to her husband and her husband said no then i think that if they wanted to do a storyline where he gets paid off by mjf for a match she wouldn't do it after this match was the darby allen versus cm punk match I am no longer a fan of CM Punk. I will continue to say that he is a one hit wonder because people on Twitter think that his career started with the pipe bomb in WWE. No, he has a very long history with PWG, with Ring of Honor, with TNA, then WWE and then AEW. Oh, and UFC if you want to count that shit. I was once a blind follower of CM Punk. Everything that he did, I put him on a high pedestal. He could do no wrong. He was the voiceless of my voice growing up as a teenager. I would not be this outspoken if it wasn't for him. I wouldn't be as confident to speak out if it wasn't for CM Punk. What made me really not want to be a fan of CM Punk anymore was how everything went down after WWE and him almost tanking his best friend's podcast and everything that went with it. What I don't like personally is how quickly he blamed others rather than trying to take 50-50 responsibility because if you are an independent contractor and you're contracted by WWE and you feel like the doctor that they have there is not doing justice to what you feel like could be something serious, you need to put your foot down. Even if Vince gets upset that you're missing and you're a no-show, at least you're going to go to an actual fucking doctor and get a doctor's note and be like, look, I felt my life was in danger. Nobody was listening to me and I did not trust the doctor. So therefore, I'm going to get my own ass to my own doctor and here are the results. Here's the paperwork. If he would have did that shit, I don't think Vince would have been upset you know, Vince would have been upset if no one told him why someone would not be a no show. But if you are a no show and then come back with paperwork of like, hey, I want to go take my health seriously. I don't think he'll be that upset and like, you know, fire you or whatever. It was the fact of that he could easily slander the doctor's name without trying to take his own health into responsibility and go get it checked out with a second opinion, a third opinion or something. I get it. He was WWE champion. But if you feel like your life is in danger, stop whatever the fuck you're doing and go get that shit checked out. Like, you shouldn't have to say that, oh, if I would have stayed there, I would have died. Of course you would have died if you would have stayed there. But at the same time, were you trying to make things right for yourself? And maybe that would have opened up Vince's eyes to be like, all right, these guys need a little more time off rather than trying to fill a schedule to go at 100 miles per hour, you know? And then there's also the fact of... Telling stories of how bigger wrestlers hurt the smaller wrestlers in the ring. And I know it happens. I'm not defending that. And I know that it happens. But sometimes you do have to be the bigger person and like teach them how to hit differently. Don't use all your strength. Don't use all your power and everything that comes with it. And if it still persists, then you're definitely going to have to tell management. Even if WWE management gets upset with you by continuing to go to them and be like, hey, this is an unsafe worker. Hey, did you see how this guy dropped me on my back or whatever? And now I have a bruise. As long as you're able to prove that people are unsafe and you don't feel right and you just go to management and you're the champion like eventually they'll start listening to you but then again every single story is a two-way street it's all communication and punk was never good at communication punk was always good at telling you off 
Punk was always good at speaking his mind and he's very talented at speaking his mind, but he also feels like he is untouchable when it comes to speaking his mind. He feels like he doesn't get in trouble. And I believe that this whole downward spiral of how his last days at WWE ended to the courts and everything, that was a fucking wake up call that you can't live untouchable and that us as fans can no longer live vicariously through his words and think that we're hot shit because i do know that every time someone says something that we're all thinking you want to live vicariously through them because you don't got the balls to say it that's what punk did for a whole entire generation every one of his promos told you what was wrong with the wrestling industry every one of his promos told you what was wrong with wwe and we all ate it up now it's time to step away from that, heal from that, and just know that you can still be your own person and still speak your truth and no longer live vicariously through punk. So my biggest thing is that because of the way that things happen, the way that he told his side of the story and how easily he could throw people under the bus told me that he was never a friend friend. Like he wouldn't have your back. He might have had your back. But again, even though you have all those feelings bottled up inside, you don't take it out on your previous employer and then get the pass from fans that it's all right, because that's not cool. If he was able to do that without a second thought, without trying to be an adult about it first behind closed doors, for trying to take everything that Carl Cabana built by hand, that just tells me you were always a fucking scumbag. Now, fast forward seven years till today, he is back in a wrestling ring having his match, and I went into it with an open mind because I wanted to see if we were going to get the same CM Punk, which we didn't really get the same CM Punk in WWE. We got the CM Punk from Ring of Honor, because when he was wrestling Darby Allin, and you can see that everything was called in the ring, nothing was discussed backstage on how they were going to go forward with this match. Everything was called in the ring. So... This was the CM Punk of old of Ring of Honor because it had the same flow. It had the same emotion of it. And that's when I started to think about his old matches that he had in Ring of Honor. His best of three series with Samoa Joe. His matches with Homicide. His matches with Chris Hero. Started off the match slow and it slowly build and build and build until we got to the finish. He made Darby Allen look like a million bucks in Chicago. And obviously Chicago still loves CM Punk. Darby Allen did have a moment where the Chicago crowd boo him, where he went up to the top rope. He mocked CM Punk's stain of going to sleep and then does the coffin drop and CM Punk sits up. I thought that was pretty funny. It shouldn't have been funny, but it kind of was. And then CM Punk does the GTS. By the way, Punk, can you please change your finisher? Kenta is the OG and the only one that should be using the GTS because he's been using it way longer than you. And he's been in the business way longer than you. He hasn't retired. Like, have some respect. It's that age old rule in professional wrestling in the indies, and you should definitely know about it. You don't use someone else's finisher when they're still wrestling. If Kenta was retired, sure, use the GTS. I don't give a shit. But because Kenta is still walking around asking you for a match and saying, fuck you, CM Punk, on Twitter, when are you going to give him that match, man? When are you going to tell Tony Khan you want to face the baddest man on the planet, Kenta, who does a better GTS than you? When is that going to happen? So please get a new finisher and do not use the Anaconda Vice because that's Tenzon's move. Like, just use a different finisher. You can use the Pepsi Plunge. I don't give a shit. Use that move. That is the hill I would die on. I will protect Kenta's GTS forever. CM Punk, get yourself a new fucking finisher. Oh, and by the way, CM Punk won that match. Next, we have our bathroom break match. Big Show versus QT Marshall. I did not care. This is the cool down match and 
show one with a choke slam. Story wise, it makes no fucking sense. The previous week, we saw Gun Club, especially Billy Gunn, take the chair and hit Big Show Paul White with the chair as if Billy Gunn wanted his own Seth Rollins moment when Seth Rollins broke up the shield. And Big Show here at All Out didn't even react or limp or do anything to remind us that Billy Gunn hit him with the chair. But either way, Big Show won. I'm calling him Big Show. And now we're going to be talking about the main event of All Elite Wrestling. We have Christian Cage taking on Kenny Omega for the AEW World Championship title. There was an instant chemistry and a beloved magic in this match. Christian Cage made Kenny Omega work. Kenny Omega does have amazing matches. Kenny Omega can adapt to anyone's style. That is what makes him dangerous. And that is why he keeps getting number one on all of these awards that we have in professional wrestling. Is because he is very well adapted in professional wrestling. And yes, he can tell stories, ladies and gentlemen. He can tell amazing stories inside the ring. Christian Cage here is just to try to keep everything neat and spectacular and do things that make sense because he does not want any type of lazy booking, lazy wrestling, or even spot fest. Christian Cage wants people to work the same way that Kenny Omega wants people to work. And Christian Cage and Kenny Omega had an amazing match at AEW All Out. Unfortunately, Christian Cage did not pick up the victory over Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega retained the AEW World Championship title. And I skipped the one thing I wanted to mention. But you guys already know Kenny it retains the title. And Christian Cage is still the Impact World Champion as well. He takes on Ace Austin come September 18th at Victory Road. What I really wanted to mention for this match that didn't make any sense is the camera was right on Don Callis and Don Callis was waving for interference to come in while the referee was distracted. So you had the good brothers who don't do shit anymore and I don't understand their hype. So we're going to call them the good sisters. Carl Anderson tries to talk that talk of them being one of the greatest tag teams, but all I see are goons following the elites and it makes no fucking sense how are you going to say you're the greatest tag team when you're in the shadow of the young bucks and you're also in the shadow of kenny omega and you're also in the shadow of being previous bullet club members like and you haven't done shit to proclaim and get your stake back of being quote unquote the greatest tag team there is hell god is ahead of you guys more than anything Anyway, I just don't like the way that Don Callis does these distraction interferences and stuff like that. It's just so really bad and awkward. And I'm like, why does it have to feel like it's a poke at how New Japan Pro Wrestling does it? Especially when Bullet Club does it with all of their members. It just doesn't feel right to have it on AW programming. And I think that... If we're going to get a Don Callis interference and or distraction by the other members, I think it needs to be well thought out and everyone needs to ask questions and play it in their head and not just be yes men in the back to be like, yes, I think we should do a distraction. And it's like, no, because Don, you don't know how to do distractions. You don't. You don't know how to do distractions that make sense there. So Kenny Omega retains the AEW World Championship title. And now we get this little segment of a beatdown where I think Jurassic Express comes out to help save everybody too, save Christian. And then everyone is down for the count. And Kenny Omega says that the only people that could ever beat him are retired or they're dead. And then bam, lights go out. And then we have Adam Cole showing up. That is right. Adam Cole decided to sign his AEW contract. He always knew he was going to go over to AEW. He has his friends there. He has Britt there. He has the love of his life there. So it only made sense. And it felt right. It felt smooth. If you guys are watching the final days of his NXT run against Kyle O'Reilly and the way that he was presented as a heel and the way that that rivalry ended helped Adam Cole become a solidified and a cemented heel 
into the elite and everything else behind it. Like, it felt really good that he was there. He got the loudest pop of the night. And his theme song is really good. So we could all go along and say, Adam Cole, baby. We could all do that now. And then he super kicks Jungle Boy. And he joins with the Elite. And now we're going to go back into Ring of Honor days. And we're going to continue that story. So be on the lookout for that. And then we get the surprise... Of the night, which is the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, makes his AEW debut and goes into the ring and looks like he's challenging Kenny Omega. I do not think Daniel Bryan is next in line. If they give it to him, I'm going to complain about it just because it doesn't make any sense. But now we get to have a full blown rivalry and fresh stories between all these men. And I am happy that both the American Dragon is here and also Adam Cole. If you go back into my logs of podcasting episodes, I did say we do not need CM Punk and we do not need Daniel Bryan. I'm still going to stand on my ground that we don't need CM Punk at the moment. But I will change my tune and say that we didn't need Daniel Bryan, but we needed the American Dragon Brian Danielson, because that's the Brian Danielson that I want. I never wanted the Daniel Bryan of WWE and the Yes movement, because again, that just makes me think that he's a one hit wonder, because that's what people just normally remember the Yes movement, and that got him over. The American Dragon has such a long historic career. And yes, I watched his whole entire career, so I know what I'm talking about. So I am happy that the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, is in AEW and made his AEW debut. Now for the fresh storylines and him kicking people in their head, I want to see all of that. I want to see how all of this unfolds. But it needs to be consistent storytelling and it needs to make sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, I'm just going to try to make it make sense in future podcast episodes that I hope you guys enjoy. And I hope you guys come back and listen to. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that has been my whole entire analysis of the really good pay-per-view. It felt like WrestleMania. It really did. Of AEW All Out 2021. I hope that the future episodes of AEW get better and the pay-per-views get better and just more exciting stories and surprises. AEW, just keep them coming. First, let me give a shout out to the Smacked Raw pod. These guys have asked me to be on their podcast and I was. I was there for reviewing AEW All Out. And then I was there for the review of AEW All Out. And then I was on their show called Unpopular Wrestling Opinions. And I love working with these guys. I love working with Kyle. I love working with Bama. And they're really great sweethearts. You guys should take a listen to it and go show them some love. You can find their YouTube with my clips on there, especially when I talk about CM Punk. You guys can get a more in-depth analysis as to why I really don't like him and I'm not going to become a fan of him again. You can head over to youtube.com forward slash smacked raw and make sure to become a subscriber to them and turn on that bell notification to know when they go live and I might be a returning guest sometime in the near future to talk about professional wrestling and to follow them on Twitter. Make sure to follow at Bama Dave 24 and also at Bama Slammer. Make sure to follow at Smacked Raw Pod for any updates for when they do unpopular wrestling opinions. And if you want to follow the amazing Kyle himself, it is going to be at the KYTY show. These guys are really great to collaborate with. If anybody out there who is a podcaster or just wants to be on the show, just hit them up, say hi, you know, do all that. And as for me, I am Marie Shadows of the Square Circle Podcast. I would love your opinions on everything wrestling. And if you disagree with anything I've said on here, that's okay. Let me hear it. Head over to anchor.fm forward slash Square Circle Podcast, where you can leave me a voice message after listening to this episode. If you are comfortable using YouTube, 
head over to youtube.com forward slash square circle podcast make sure to become a subscriber and hit that bell notification to get notified every time i upload a professional wrestling video at my thoughts on professional wrestling if you want to keep this conversation going on twitter make sure to at me at marie underscore shadows and if you want to take the support even further, because I do value your support and your opinion, I do have a Patreon. A Patreon is an amazing membership platform where you get to support your favorite content creators. And I work my ass off to make the content that I make for you guys as well. So if you want to support me in that and get cool goodies and, and awesome things and participate in Twitter spaces, Zoom calls and everything like that, head over to patreon.com forward slash marie shadows where it is us together making wrestling memories all right guys thank you for listening to this episode of the square circle podcast i am your host marie shadows and i'll see you guys on the next one